at the end of the day, you, honestly, you put aside pride and emotion to make a decision that, you know, you, you prioritize the ocean or the environment and that will tell you what the decision needs to be. Hello and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Silverwood. And our guest on the podcast today is Pete Zaglinski, who is the co-founder and the CEO of Seabin Project. Now, Pete has been on the Ocean Impact podcast before. You can tune into episode two to learn a little bit more about Pete and the origin story of Seabin Project. But for this particular conversation, we really wanted to focus with Pete on what's happened since that date when we last had him on the podcast in February 2020. The answer is a lot. He runs through how the business model of the organization has changed significantly. They've raised about $3 million through two separate equity crowdfunding campaigns through Birchall. And they've announced a lot of partnerships, uh, notably a recent one with Coca-Cola. Now, this is naturally a pretty controversial maneuver for CBIN with many loyal fans around the world firmly on the side of the fence that Coca-Cola is one of the world's great polluters and using vast quantities of single-use plastic. So why has Pete chosen to partner with Coca-Cola? And I think Pete gives us a pretty firm and reasoned perspective on the reasons why. We have to remember that Pete and Seabin Project are a business and they're in the business of having more sea bins in oceans and waterways around the world being serviced by people to create cleaner oceans. And that's not easy. Pete has tried a number of different approaches to scale their operation to get more bins in the water and more plastic and microplastics and other pollutants out. So I stand in the middle of this one because I've been very vocal in my opposition to Coca-Cola for a really long time. This includes uh, protesting outside the front of their offices in Australia, attending their annual general meetings, and generally leading campaigns to really try and get them to move on reducing the pollution of their products and increasing their recycling and adopting the circular economy. But when I look at this and I see the feedback on one side, I see different perspectives, but at the end of the day, I really believe in what Pete is doing with Seabin Project, and I really believe that partnerships are key to making the kind of impact we need to be making right now at the scale we need to be making them. So I'll let you tune into the episode and make up your own mind, but I'm sure you'll enjoy this conversation with Pete Zaglinski, co-founder and CEO of Seabin Project. Very excited to have on the Ocean Impact podcast today, Pete Zaglinski, who is the co-founder and CEO of Seabin Project. Uh, how are you, Pete? Hey, uh, very good, Tim, and um, thanks for having me on again. Um, yeah, you, you're our first uh, repeat customer on the Ocean Impact podcast. If people uh, haven't uh, seen or heard episode 20, uh, episode number two, you can head back into the archives and listen to the first conversation with Pete and myself recorded at our office in Manly back in February 2020. So I suppose we'd start the conversation there, Pete. It's um, a lot's happened in the 15 months or so since we last recorded a podcast. How's about we get a little bit of a, an update on all things CB that's happened in the last uh, 15 months or so? Yeah, absolutely. It feels like an eternity, to be honest. It was pre-COVID our last chat, wasn't it? We were just on the eve of the uh, of the world going into a spin. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, like five or six weeks before. Oh, yeah, holy shit, eh? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, for us, a, a lot's happened. Um, I guess the biggest one is that we've turned our business model 180 degrees on its head, where we aren't selling sea bins to private clients anymore, but we are literally targeting entire cities where we supply uh, service packages, um, which means that our existing clients, marinas and, and, you know, sort of people around the waterfronts will be getting free cleanup services. And 
I guess the biggest thing is that for us, um, we kind of, we've transitioned to be data driven. So we lead with data monitoring. Uh, secondary is uh, prevention, education, community engagement, and, and the byproduct is this utility of cleanup. So, you know, we're, we're turning off a tap, we're cleaning up, we're working on behavioural change. And, uh, and yeah, so that's the biggest one. And uh, this was all made possible in April last year where we raised $1.71 million uh, crowdfunding on virtual. Um, we raised, I think, a million dollars a few days before COVID hit. And then we still closed out, you know, during COVID, people were losing jobs and just stock markets suspended and trading. And yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, and then, uh, you know, from this raise, we, we were literally hit with this, you know, global pandemic of um, entire countries were shutting down and, and they were, you know, we, we operate in 54 countries and, and so um, we were, I guess, faced with this uh, decision of, do we hibernate, use the money to just, you know, survive through God knows how long it would be, or do we double down, um, meet our obligations from the investors and hope to hell that um, the pandemic was short term and we would come out the other side with something to show. And so we doubled down. Um, so instead of laying off people, uh, we actually employed people. We employed four people and uh, we um, onboarded a, a global COO over in Los Angeles. We got uh, local positions here in Australia and Sydney. Um, we developed our, our next tech, CBINs. We put digital sensors in there. We've built our pollution index digital assets where we have a we partnered up with um, a, uh, the Australian Manufacturing and Growth Centre with uh, University of Technology Sydney, Evolve Group and TPS. And we, we've literally, we've built these, um, a mobile data app. We've built a, a digital dashboard where we have automated data reporting that supports our citizen science. And we've got an interactive web map. And um, we've also made all this open source. Um, we launched our Sydney pilot where we saw that what we were doing by selling single C bins wasn't sustainable. And that um, you know we could we could essentially package um, all of this into one into one product and and literally so we launched a Sydney pilot um, employed a few people for that uh, we gave ourselves twelve months of self funded runway um, and then Discovery Channel got on board as a major as a principal sponsor which was just insane um pretty honored that we're even like on the radar and then um we realized that we'd sort of built everything we needed to uh we met all our obligations and we have proof of concept down there in sydney with what we do and so we actually we, we needed seed capital to then start scaling and growing and so we did a seed round too with virtual about a month ago and yeah we raised uh, one 1.2 mil in four days which was just insane and so um we're now in discussions with other cities around the world about how we take this scaling you know sort of growth plan and replicate that in other countries and working with governments and councils and cities and and all sorts uh, so <laughs> quite a bit has happened yes. in 15 months you could say that. And yes, so that last episode, as we were saying, uh, it was right on the eve. I think expressions of interest were, were open for the initial virtual equity crowdfund campaign. You just mentioned 1.7 million raised in that one and then followed up with a, a successful one in 2021. But back to that, um, that significant change in, in the business model, at what point in the journey was it starting to realise for you that selling units versus selling the service was starting to look like the, the real way forward for the organization, for the business? Uh, there, there was a few factors. I mean, one of them was that um, the CBIN technology is amazing if it's maintained and, and you know, um, upkeep sort of thing is there. And so we had the uh, CBINs in some locations that were just amazing. We had, you know, really sort of vested clients that saw the benefit of keeping the water clean and the data monitoring. And then we had other locations where they put the CBIN in, there's a bit of 
you know, pizzazz for a month or two and then, you know, they don't clean it and then it sort of starts to slow down and it doesn't work. And we just saw that as being a bit of a liability for something that, you know, is, is like can substantially make an impact in the water and out of the water. And then people started paying us to do the servicing and then we saw that, you know, from a profit profitability um, point of view, if you look at a, a SARS um, business model, where you've got software as a service, uh, it becomes recurring revenue. And so if we could get um, recurring revenue, it means that, means that we can get better technology, we can employ more people, we can scale our impact. And so we just saw that you could do a once in a lifetime sale of a piece of product that you know, is, will be great, or you could do 10 years worth of service contracts and upgrades and, and just increase your impact and you know, invest in re, um, research and development and you know, scaling the, um, the science program because the world revolves around money, um, unfortunately. It makes so much sense. And so when you did start to do that 180 and mapping out what the future might look like, how did those, uh, I suppose, prospective goals change in terms of the number of units that could be in place around the world with this new servicing model versus the existing model? Did it really start to just become, not only could you look at your revenue lines increasing, but you could also look at the scale of the quantity of units actually doing their, doing their work out there? Well, uh, yes. And, and the weird thing is there'll be less units with this new business model. So we found that, um, you know, you, you can, if you focus on a city, you're focusing on a really jam packed, you know, bunch of people and humans mean, you know, pollution, well, it's humans that litter. And so when you got more people, you got more litter. And so in rural or regional areas, there's not much pollution and you don't really need the sea bins there. And uh, so, yeah, what we're actually doing is reducing our footprint um, and increasing the impact, which is pretty amazing, but quite weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, it wasn't a decision that we made lightly, but it was, the writing was on the wall. You know, how can we get smarter? How can we be more sustainable? And, you know, how, how do we actually scale and grow? You know, the first four years of selling to private marinas and clients was great. And that got us a proof of concept. You know, this stuff works. It has impact. It's not perfect, but, um, and then we're like, well, what's the next phase? And so we packaged everything into the city pilot and just self-funded it and just jumped in the deep end <laughs> again. And I've loved seeing the Sydney City Pilot. Um, notably, you see the, the vans and the technicians zipping around town. You've done a great job of communicating that experience to your supporters and to your audience. Um, but you also sort of found, I suppose, the some challenges initially in funding. You just mentioned that you've, you've had to self-fund it, but the goal, I suppose, early on did seem it was about trying to get the local government to pick up the tab. How did that strategy work out and how will that be integrated into the model moving forward? Uh, well, it was the inactivity of the city of Sydney that really you know, helped us develop this model. And uh, so what happened was, in October in 2019, there was a unanimous motion passed by the councillors to investigate the sea bins, how it can be a, an asset to, you know, keeping, keeping the world's greatest harbour cleaner and, and using visual communication, which is huge. Um, and then, so we, we were stoked. And six months later, when we did our, we were setting up the crowdfunding, we hadn't heard like anything from the city. And we thought it was really strange that you could pass a unanimous motion and then, you know, crickets, you know, nothing. And, you know, this was like our first proper experience of dealing with a government or a city or something. And I'm pretty sure, it, well, I hope it's not standard procedure, but anyway. And so this, this essentially sort of ignited something in me where, hey, you know, what if we self-funded this? So what if we take the initiative to lead with the first step and we'll self-fund it. And so we built it into our investment offer doc and we told all the shareholders that we're going to use uh, up to $240,000 to invest in this city pilot. And this is going to be our growth and scaling plan. And, and so that's what we did. We launched it. 
essentially it's community funded it was self-funded there's you know money out of our pocket um and it created such a buzz that like there was corporate sponsors that were coming on board like the discovery channel and some other smaller ones and you know it all added up and then with the investment program and the fact we were doing this you know here in sydney in our own backyard we you know we had 1600 invested uh, investors that were lobbying for this because you know we know it's the right thing to do and you know and then we had communities that were getting together and they're like you know lobbying come on support cbin you guys done this unanimous motion what's the go put your money where your mouth is sort of you know sort of thing um and then uh you know, in 12 months, uh, well, it's coming up to 12 months next month, uh, where, you know, we, we've, everything we do, we measure the impact of, um, you know, it's all tangible stuff. And so in the last 12 months in Sydney Harbour, we, we know that we've filtered 3.3 billion litres of water for microplastics and plastic fibres, oil and, and, and more. Um, we've collected 16.3 tonnes of marine litter uh, in, the, in that 12 months. And we know that, you know, through social media and through events and community engagements that we've reached more than 10 million people in, in the last 10 mo uh, 12 months. But then, you know, the, in terms of the support from the city of Sydney, it's weird, it's been neglig negligible. Um, the main excuse that we found was it's not their problem. And then the next one was, you know, because it's not our problem, technically we're not um responsible for this it would be a waste of taxpayers funds um which was you know a bit of an eye opener and then we realized that uh, a lack of governance was really a major challenge um there was a lot of finger pointing you know oh it's not our rubbish it comes from upstream it comes from there you know point left point right and um and that's what we've been dealing with over the last 12 months we've had a little bit of support but Honestly, it's been set like nearly next to zero, uh, which is really disappointing, you know, given that like tourism and Sydney Harbour is like, it's a major asset. And let's keep that clean, you know, let's keep it clean anyway, even if it wasn't an asset. Like, yeah, and I can so, imagine the, the huge frustration for you when you consider how much money is being spent on managing waste and managing litter on terra firma, on land, but as soon as it gets into the waterway, then the finger pointing starts and they want to really shirk responsibility, yet it's the public amenity of the people that are living in those areas impacted by the pollution, um, which really should translate into financial support to clean it up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a new problem. It's, a, it's I think we're on track, you know, we're, but, um, you know, this, the weird thing is like, we've got the data that, we can trace back to streets. We can chase back to intersections with parking tickets of all things, you know. It's got the city of Sydney's name on it. It's got like, you know, date and time and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and then, you know, there's other data sets that we have where we, we know it's waste leakage and we know where it comes from. We know where it originates from. And, but it's, um, we, we're just trying to coexist with them and find a common ground, not upset them, and, but, you know, still be firm, which is, pretty tricky <laughs> so obviously when you start mapping and we'll talk a bit further on about the 100 smart cities project but when you start mapping out this expansion of course you're out there looking for councils and other government bodies to fund these uh implementations into other cities aren't you so it's not like you've had a bad experience with city of sydney and you think oh it's not going to be local government anymore you've, you've got an open mind to who, who will come to the party to fund these in the future yeah, absolutely. And we've, we've, actually, we've, we've used the experience to map out the business model and it's like a, you know, there's a, a multitude of steps. And the first step is you need proof of concept to justify the use of taxpayers' funds. So, you know, there's no city or council in the world in their right minds that will sign a cheque, you know, substantial money for something that's not proven because that may be the, the, the waste of taxpayers' funds. And so, to get over that first hurdle, um, one we've got, uh, you know, we had the we had the luck to have that extra money where we could self fund it. Uh, two, we've got corporate sponsorships that are funding us, you know, to clean up. Uh, and three, there are grants available by the city which we've applied for, but 
you know, it's hit or miss. You can't rely on a grant. But, um, and so to get the proof of concept in the business model is um, looking at corporate sponsorship, innovation grants, and a few other things to really get that proof of concept. From there, you know, we will file for a, a procurement of a paid trial with the city. Um, and then from there, working with the city, working on how do we get state or federal funding to assist them. Um, so, yeah, there's a few layers to it, but we're all positive. We, you know, we, we're taking a lot of learnings from this experience and, and it's super positive. Um, yeah. And city uh, of Sydney, at least the harbour itself and its beaches are looking the better for it, mate. And they're in really incredible statistics there, 16.3 tonnes of litter removed by how many units is it in the Sydney City pilot? Uh, there's 16 units over seven locations, which is a eight kilometre radius. <clears throat> I mean, look, it's, it's not even going to put a dent in the world's problems and, you know, but it, it, it's a start. And visually, the, the pollution that we have in Sydney Harbour, it's first world problems, but visually it looks worse than it is. But the problem that we're starting to see, which is really alarming, is what you can't see. So this is the plastic fibres, microfibres, microplastics. Um, but, um, mate, it's a, it's a start, you know, you've got to start somewhere. You certainly do. And you have been leading on this for uh, a good few years now, mate. Must be coming up to five years almost, right, since you launched or afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So great update. Really enjoyed yeah, that. Um, but let's talk about, I guess, the, the news that's really been sort of sweeping across the airwaves in the last two to three weeks, which is the, the new partnership with Coca-Cola. Um, would love to just sort of hear it from... From your mouth, tell us a little bit about the partnership, uh, what it hopes to achieve, um, and then we can have a little bit more of a, a deeper chat about it. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely made a bit of a buzz and a bit of enviro gossip, that's for sure. Um, the partnership, it's pretty simple. Um, the, uh, we, we had Coca-Cola reach out through the sustainability department um, we offered for them to come down to meet with our enviro technicians on the route, which they did. They jumped in the van and the first place they went to and the first thing they saw was Coke bottles inside the sea bins. Um, you know, and then, then, and then it just sort of snowballed from there into like, you know, wow, like we know we have a problem, but this is really, yeah, it's, you know, it's branded litter. And I don't think any company in the world wants to have branded litter. Um, and, you know, they, they know they got problems. they got massive problems. They're the biggest polluter. And um, it was simple stuff. We, we, we put emotion and pride aside to make a decision that will fast track, we believe will fast track solutions to plastic pollution problems. Because, you know, if, you, if you're the, one of the world's biggest polluters, like why, why are you not trying to fix the problem, you know? And so what the partnership is, and we can get into that more. I've got a few things like a few little notes and stuff, but what it is, is it's really simple. It's a 12 month funding program for our citizen science uh, specific to Sydney. And so the funding will go to um, uh, paying some of the volunteers, uh, getting better at the um, in investing in the, in the data protocol and just really dial, dialing in the data program um, which we can then use in a multitude of ways, but yeah, so it's a it's a really simple partnership, but it yeah it caused a bit of um, bit of a sensation. So starting simple, but I'm imagining, and obviously the way you've presented it, it was it was a big thing, probably one of the biggest things I'm imagining you've had to do um, in your journey with CBIN to date. But there must be some some great and grand aspirations of of what a robust partnership with a brand like Coca-Cola can do for you into the future. So it's, it's starting small. Can you tell us a little bit about where you hope or intend that it can go into the future? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is our first, you know, step or foray in a partnership with uh, somebody like Coca-Cola. And so, you know, we kept it to a, something attainable, something tangible. But, um, you know, the, the global footprint of Coca-Cola is massive. The, the global impact of you know the of the you know the single use plastic bottles and you know all the other stuff that goes into the packaging their products is just insane and you know they want to do something about it and 
you know, we, we want to do something about it as well. And so, you know, start with one thing and then look at scaling up and scale up the impact. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's the long and short of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And obviously around um, the same time, we learn of another major uh, the ocean cleanup project. I was going to say another major ocean cleanup project. Um, they've, they've put it in the name of their organization, similarly announcing a partnership. And, and obviously Coca-Cola have been supporting cleanup operations for, for decades. Um, a lot of them in Australia as well, whether it's, you know, Coast Care, Keep Australia Beautiful, Eco Barge Clean Seas, Plastic Collective, Boomerang Alliances, Ausmap. So it's, it's not new. They're, uh, they've got a big problem and they're supporting solutions to help mitigate it. But um, when you sort of look at the, obviously, you know a little bit from your perspective, working with Coca-Cola, Amatil in Australia, but looking at what they're doing on that global scale and supporting projects like the Ocean Cleanup, um, what do you see from them as a business in terms of their commitment to really getting in there and uh, addressing the problem that they have and the problem that obviously the planet has? Um, look, it, Coca-Cola are a multi, multi-billion dollar company. They're not stupid, they're smart. You know, they know what their problem is and they know that they can't continue on this trajectory with a woke culture. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's prevention and awareness, it's take three, it's every other person working in Enviro world that is, you know, changing like everybody, like, you know, people are refusing single use and legislation is being created, you know, from this woke culture. And, and so at the end of the day, if, if Coke don't change, they're out of business, but then, you know, they're smart. So they, they know they need to change, you know, to keep continuing and it's in their best interest to, you know, just stop this pollution and, and find, you know, solutions, work on solutions, work with other people. And I mean, if they were stupid, they would just be like, no, nah, we're not changing. We're just going to do what we want. And then we'd end up winning because legislation says you can't package Coca-Cola in a plastic bottle anymore, you know. So I don't yeah. know. It's, it's such a convoluted thing, but at the end of the day, it's not sustainable for them or the environment or anyone, and it's in their best interest to fix this. Yeah, and they're a couple of years into their bold statements around taking charge on this issue. There was, um, you know, obviously decades and recent years of, of, of inaction, but when their World Without Waste uh, initiative launched, I think it was 2019, um, it really showed that they were not just making a renewed commitment, they were putting some numbers to it. So if you go and check out the World Without Waste um, campaign page, you'll find out it's, it's big figures. It's saying that for every bottle they produce, they'll be able to show that they've collected or supported the collection and the recycling of every single product by 2030. It's, um, I think they're already at 70% recycled content in their um, plastic bottles in markets like Australia. Um, and that's going to be 100% by 2025. So there's, there's serious stuff. It's very much in line with this notion of a circular economy being something real and tangible that coupled with systems to prevent leakage and clean up the what gets out there, you can start to have a world with a heck of a lot less waste, maybe not no waste because um, we know that's just not sort of tangible. But yeah, it is, it is from my perspective, it's, it's, there's a lot of legitimacy to it. Um, I get a lot of the community sentiment there around Coca-Cola's track record in, in putting a bit of greenwash on things, on, on making um, claims but not really substantiating them. But for you and for people like the Ocean Cleanup, I mean, if that means more bins in the water, removing pollution and supporting the servicing of those entire cities, if it means for the ocean cleanup, more of their interceptors going into rivers in developing countries and showing what's coming out. I mean, that's a good thing for the ocean and people, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's really hard to transition that mindset of they're the enemy and there's this stigma of you don't work with the enemy, you fight the enemy. and 
but it's not very productive. You know, it's like you take Dr. Jane Goodall, you know, she's celebrated around the world for environmental work and all the progress that she's made. And she sat down with, you know, chemical and oil companies and, you know, she sat down with the enemy and she fast tracked solutions. You know, she, she was the one that said like, you know, arguing and shouting at people isn't productive, you know? And so we, we, we started to look at people like her as inspiration and, you know, coexisting to find a solution to a common problem. Um, one of the big things that I noticed a few years ago was uh, World Wildlife Fund partnered up with an oil tycoon in, from Norway to build an ocean research vessel to the tune of $350 million uh, euros. And, you know, it's like, it's just putting the stigma aside and trying to coexist to find solutions or even fast track it. So, you know, it exists. There's so many people working with Coca-Cola and, you know, it's nothing new for what we're doing, but it's definitely going to help, you know, our impact and scale it up and speak to more people and remove more rubbish and filter more water. And, you know, hopefully on land and in water, we have that same impact going. How is it though from a from a personal side, Pete? I mean, um, you know, I've I've known you for a few years now, and you know your dogged determination to get this business and the foundation humming ultimately to improve the health of the ocean, and you sort of get out there, and you obviously you have to really contemplate and consider how it's going to what it's going to mean for you and for the business to to announce this partnership. But then you, you know you do cop a bit of flack online. I mean. How's that been for you? I mean, I know, I know you're, a, you're a tough cookie, but has it been a bit rough? Um, you know, the weird thing is that it's been 99.9% .9 positivity from all of our supporters. There wasn't one negative comment on LinkedIn. Twitter was amazing. Instagram and Facebook started getting a bit fruity. Um, but it's been like, honestly, it's been like 99.9% .9 super positive, positive, you know, and that, that's pretty amazing, especially in this day and age of social media with, you know, online trolls and like non-factual opinion driven criticism. And so, but I, I try to be a bit thicker skinned. Um, it took me a long time to make the decision to say yes. And yes, we will work with Coke. Um, but at the end of the day, you, Honestly, you put aside pride and emotion to make a decision that, you know, you, you prioritise the ocean or the environment and that will tell you what the decision needs to be. Um, you know, we, we, could, we don't have a business model where we need an enemy. You know, we don't need to go out and lobby and petition people to elevate ourselves or, you know, we, we have a, an approach where we coexist. Like, we just want cleaner oceans, you know. We... It all, it all helps, don't get me wrong, you know, boycotting Coke, I already do that. I don't drink their shit, you know, but like I'm a minority. Majority do because Coca-Cola are a business that, you know, everyone loves, not everyone, but a lot of people love their product. They're going to be here. They're going to be around, you know. It's like how do you work with that and just fast track solutions? Um, so personally, I'm not too bothered, to be honest. Like I thought we'd cop more flack. To like, I thought there'd be more trolling. Um, I hope people don't take that as an opportunity to come out and get me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty but, poor form when you do see some of the the behaviour of of community you know members online who do engage in trolling and and really counterintuitive and counterproductive when particularly some of the characters you know their intentions are cleaner seas and clean, healthier oceans too. So that 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 kind of gets under my skin a bit too, mate. <laughs> Yeah, it, it does. But at the end of the day, I think of the bigger picture and that, you know, while I'm disappointed that you've got these assholes out there that just strive to bring other people down, um, I'm kind of stoked that, you know, that, that they have a passion, even though it's like misdirected or misguided or, you know, just really toxic and negative and shit. But like, it's good to see that they care, just that it's unfortunate they're trying to, you know, bring other people down. Um, but you're always going to get haters. Uh, That's a good point, isn't it? Because, and I suppose there's, um, you know, for those 0.01% out there who are, who are tuning into this and, 
you know, looking at it and wanting to sling mud, I mean, those people do hold partnerships like this to account and they do ensure that, you know, the the integrity of the organisation is going to be front and centre um, and that this, you know, that it's not going to be, it's not going to be greenwashing. I mean, I know you and your supporters, the 99.9 know you and they know this campaign, this partnership is not built on any sort of um, greenwashing foundations. It's built to empower you to do your best work. So you're right though. I mean, those people out there, they do kind of hold you to account, but it doesn't need to get personal and, and, and vicious like it does in some forums. No, no, I mean, yeah, it's just shit that, Anyway, <laughs> we're going to talk about this for days. I'm sure we're going to hear from a few of them. <laughs> yeah. Like at the end of the day, you know, all this trolling and online, you know, harassment and like it's unfortunate, but it's just there's always going to be those people. So, you know, what do you do? Do you stand up to a bully? Do you report them? Do you, I don't know, yeah. work in progress? Just don't be like them unless you really want to be. <laughs> Don't be like them and, and, and make sure on the other side you can, um, you know, prioritise you being able to do your best work because that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about uh, cleaner oceans. Um, so I guess, um, what was I going to go to now? I've got a whole bunch of questions here. I suppose the one, yeah, that was coming up a little bit on just a couple of forums was around, you know, that decision not to talk about the prospective Coca-Cola relationship when you had just closed out a recent equity crowdfunding raise. Um, you know, I mean, I could, you know, I'll, put, I'll let you respond. I don't want to put any sort of words into your mouth, but, you know, just maybe just talk a little bit to that particular um, criticism that has come up online. Well, um, it's pretty simple and it's like, we're just, like, Seabin are not a listed company. And so with um, crowdsource funding, like it's actually against the rules to put, to, to raise money on speculative items. And so the Coke partnership, it wasn't finished. It was still in progress. And so that is literally considered speculative. Um, and that was the, the, for the same reason for the crowdsource funding rules, we didn't put financial projections into our offer dot because, you know, it's speculative. We don't, we, yeah, we, we think we might hit five mil or 50 mil or a hundred mil, but we might not. And so the rules with crowdsource funding is really dialed into that to, you know, to stop people from telling porky pies about the business trying to raise. Uh, so because the deal wasn't finished, it was speculative, and so we didn't talk about it. Like we got, we got a lot going on, um, you know, with Coca Cola being one of them. But it takes years to get some of these partnerships signed off, and uh, yeah, because it wasn't finished, we didn't talk about it. I yeah, mean, well, as, soon as, it, not as soon as we finished the raise, it was like a week later or something. You know, we we put it out there and front and center, and just you know, see what the fallout was going to be, but it was like super positive. Um, yeah, but that's that's the main reason was that it was speculative. And so, you know, by law, you can't put that in. Yeah, um, I'm assuming that uh, amongst your investor community, which I'd, I'd love to hear the latest figures of the number of people that are, are now shareholders of CBIN. Um, close, sure, 3, close to 3,000. Close to 3,000, right? I'm sure they're yeah. looking... Uh, at, a, at a partnership with, with an organisation of the scale of Coca-Cola and thinking, well, wow, this is uh, my investment just became a little bit more exciting. Oh, absolutely. We got like on, uh, I think on LinkedIn, there's like 43 comments and everyone was just, this is great. This is fabulous. And then there's heaps of investors saying, you know, this is amazing. Like this is a great decision and this is very bold. And, you know, we applaud you, you know, the guts and determination to, to put that pride and emotion aside and, and to work on it. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, we were on Facebook, there was a few comments like, Oh, I wish we hadn't have invested. Now you guys have sold your souls. And, but you know, it's like 0.1%. You just can't please everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And as we just discussed before those forums, um, you know, it, it, we'd be, we'd be surprised if 
you, you didn't get that sort of activity taking place. It's such, it's such the norm in those forums now. Um, and, you know, we've just got to understand that's going to take shape. I've, I've copped a little bit, you know, since starting OIO and I, I, I was fine for all my 10 years at Take 3 for the Sea out there waving the placards and going to the Coca-Cola Amatol AGM and speaking out to the shit, to the, the board of directors. I mean, I was the golden child, but um, now that I've, uh, you know, evolved as a human being and has evolved as an environmentalist and starting to use um, the tool of business to create grand scalable change, you, you, you get some of this negative flack and um, it hurts a bit because, you know, I think I'm doing, um, not only have I got a legacy of, of my previous organisation with Take 3 for the Sea, but I've got a really exciting uh, future ahead with the impact we can achieve with OIO and all the businesses that we're supporting. So, you know, mm. it, it bums me out a little bit, but I've, uh, I must admit, I, I don't try and get too deep into those online worlds because it would probably start to get under my skin. I just don't even want to go there. So I just put a little, you know, bit of black paper over that page and don't go there. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm... I'm like I'm I'm torn. Um, I don't like bullies. I can't stand bullies. I, in my head, I paint this picture of like my kids are at school being bullied. You know, what would you do? Would you stand up to them? Would you fix it? You know, majority of the time, the bullies are cowards. They've got their own problems and they take it out on others. And so, I I'm torn. I'm I can't stand online harassment and bullying. And you've got to wonder how many other people they've done that to previously, or how many they've other people they will and so I'm torn between taking a stand and letting it consume me and so I'm trying to find a bit of a balance there like you know you, you don't harass people that's just it's not on whether it's online on the street you know or on a phone call or something just you need a bit of respect so I'm not sure <laughs> I'm still trying to work it out well good on you and I think um you know those of us working I guess on the front line a little bit with environmental organizations um probably really did sort of feel for you a little bit as being, um, you know, uh, not, not the first. We, saw, we spoke about the many organisations um, who've partnered with Coca-Cola before, but maybe the first in a while and, and you know, your, your image is so so powerful and pristine that, uh, you know, it was obviously a big thing for you and you expressed that in your sentiment in some of your communications about it was a tough decision. But I hope today's chat has, uh, has helped people understand a little bit more um, so the reasons why and, and what it meant for you and the consideration you took into the process. So I appreciate you divulging all that today, mate. It's, it's, it's actually kind of flattering in a weird way that you're on their radar. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, cool. Righto. You're take a bit that. of a dick, but like, good on. Good one, mate. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, take that, mate. Take any, uh, any, any of that good stuff you can out of it and, and use that to power your... Tell yourself moving forward. Um, where are you at? Uh, last time we on the podcast, we were talking a little bit about some of the changes to product manufacturing and and new models of the unit. Um, where are you at now with with the with the current units and um, and manufacturing? Uh, we're we're in a pretty good place actually. We're um, we should have a splashdown of the commercial units in the first week of August. Uh, we've got two models um, of the same, well, it's the same hardware, but uh, the second version of it's all tricked out with uh, digital water sensors and uh, with full IoT connectivity. Uh, we got we got a modem on the dock that are taking the water sensors, sending it to the cloud. The cloud then sends it to your mobile app and the digital dashboard and uh, a few other things. and. Uh, yeah, so the the actual the the hardware and the product itself is um, it's super exciting, and uh, we've even dialed in the pump um, a little bit more to have uh, double the flow with the same um, the same energy consumption, which is uh, I think it's three dollars thirty one a day, uh, so less than the cup of coffee in Sydney, uh, a good cup of coffee. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just really dialing it in and you know we've got like four years worth of learnings from our first product that we designed on like a shoestring, shoestring budget and um, you know we've put that into it and the other 
the other thing that we haven't really advertised too much is that um, I just finished a meeting this morning with the CO2 and SMC Marine, both based in Sydney. And, um, you know, we've, we've made a partnership to develop the, the big sucker, uh, the Nautilus system, which has um, got like a 2.6 cubic metre capacity. It's uh, 2.4 metres um, in diameter and it's like, it, it's big. <laughs> Um, and we're going to be, we're, we're developing that now. We don't have a splashdown yet, uh, ETA or anything, but, you know, we, we're starting to talk about sort of bigger um, litter volumes and under the um, existing infrastructure. So like a Circular Quay, Darling Harbour, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, promenade and, um, you know, dock and, and all that, and all the debris gets pushed under there. And, and so, yeah, just, just looking at that. And, uh, and then obviously the digital assets as well for the pollution index. Um, yeah, so it's uh, pretty exciting. So August is gonna be the month for us. Wow, the Nautilus sounds really impressive. And I suppose um, incredible applications, not just you mentioned in cities like Sydney, where you're gonna have a high pollution load, but really getting into some parts of the world that, uh, you know, you probably put a traditional unit in, it's gonna be chockers, really quick right so that's that's the idea you're going to expand the scale to be able to capture um bigger quantities in hotspots yeah so we're 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 scaling it up to you know you'd, you'd empty it like once every sort of two weeks or something but we've um we've dialed it in and got the engineering down where we're still capturing plastic microfibers and you know the microplastics and the nurdles and that um it's definitely not going to be like a third world developing country solution. It'll still be first world type stuff, but um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just working on that, but um, pretty exciting though. And how are you going with some of the design elements around tidal areas and fixed pylons versus floating? Have you got that one addressed? Yeah. Yeah. We've had a fixed dock unit that's been operational in the Brunswick Head Boat Harbour now for about 12 months. Uh, we've pulled it out of the water to sort of re reassess the design and um, dial that in. But uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we've been restricted to putting the units on floating docks and infrastructure. And then we, you know, we realised that maybe that's only say 40% of a waterfront and 60 to 70% is uh, existing um, fixed structure. And so uh, the pylons and stuff like that. And yeah, we found a solution of how to do that. But then, uh, you yeah, know, we're not, we're not, we can't just put it anywhere because you still need access and visibility and a few other uh, logistical items to make it work. But yeah, so we, we're getting that going. It's got, we got a fair bit on, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do feel for you, mate. But, um, you know, I also am ecstatic that as you take bigger and bigger bites of, of your mission, you know, the, the support is around you. Um, I've loved to see the team grow. I've seen that you've got some, some new opportunities emerging for, for new team members. So uh, I just hope at the end of the day, you get for a, you go for a surf or at the start of the day, you go for a surf and the salt water brings a smile to your dial, mate. Is that still the case? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely go through stress periods where I have a like a mental block of you know doing something that you know makes me happy which is literally going for a surf or a swim in the morning and then um i get a bit bummed about it because like if when, when i find a hurdle i always want to find a solution and you know it just happens to be that the hurdles in my head and so it's like you know time to sort of focus on myself and it's a really simple solution though. Like I just need to go down to the beach before work and at least try and get three waves. Um, and if the surf's really crappy, like just jump in and have a swim. And I don't know what happens, but it just makes me feel good and happy, you know? And then all of a sudden, like happy Pete's more productive. <laughs> yeah, and, my wife is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> looks at me in the eye and says, go for a surf. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. But you know, you're like, oh, I need to go to the office and you go to the office, but you're like procrastinating on social media or just, you know, fluffing around and you're not very productive and you're just stressed and like just 30 minutes, that's all you need. Mm. And uh, makes a world of difference. It does indeed. 
Well, we might uh, start to wrap up today's conversation. So a chance to talk through anything that you haven't had the chance to talk to yet. Um, on the back of that chat, maybe there's a bit of words of advice or experience for people that are you know, going through tough times with their own entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, but yeah, maybe just a chance to, to reflect and, and speak to some points that you haven't got to yet, mate. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of that entrepreneurial stuff, like we've sort of, we got forced into transparency by doing a crowdfunding campaign in 2016 where we, you know, we had to show how we spent people's money. And so, um, you know, we've, we've always been really transparent and honest and, and I've always enjoyed helping other people. Um, like if, if I've learned something and they're facing the same problem, you know, I can pass on what I've learned or what I think might, might be totally wrong, but, and so if there is anyone out there that, you know, have a startup or a business or you're trying to make an impact and you've got some hurdles and, you know, if I can help reach out through uh, social media or through our website, and, you know, we can have a coffee or a phone call and um, like, I'm not an expert, I'm not really a businessman or anything, but I've, I've definitely got through a few hurdles and problem solved my way out of shit fights. And um, yeah, so, you know, that's, that's there if everyone wants to reach out. Oh, that'd be great. If you want to go for a surf, that'd be even better. <laughs> um, and then um, I guess the, the next stage for us is uh, taking the Sydney pilot and literally scaling it up to 100 cities. You know, that's we always sort of, well, I like a challenge and um, there's 10,000 cities in 194 countries that have, you know, ocean plastic uh, problems, but uh, we figured if we can hit a hundred cities, uh, we can literally, we can change the world. And, you know, we're not talking about cleaning up a hundred cities. We're talking about behavioral change and legislation and, you know, governance and the whole turning off the tap whilst cleaning up, you know, that that's our focus, which is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big thing, but we really think it's attainable. Um, so, yeah. So next steps is uh, LA, um, Palma Mallorca, Toronto, um, and then there's a couple of others that are, you know, we're in discussions with and yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. It really is. And obviously I'm sure you'd appreciate anyone to become new followers, new members of your community. Um, would there be future equity crowdfunding opportunities? Where do you think the organization's um, going next in terms of crowd involvement? Uh, definitely there, there will be, um, uh, future crowdfunding opportunities. Um, you know, in, in the scaling plan, we, we know that we need to get community support, community engagement. And then, you know, we, we just figured like, if we're going to take on an entire city, we need to lobby them. We need voices. So, and, and we need money to do it as well. You know, set up a, a the van, employ people, you know, it, it all costs money. And so we realized that, you know, if we could activate a community and then have them vested with say buying shares into you know solutions, you know it's it's great. And so the best way that we found was using the uh, equity crowdfunding um, platforms, and you know you can do that in the USA, over in Europe, in London. And so you know we, we found that this is our sort of process. This is how we get our you know our our first step, and then start to evolve and scale it up. And if anyone else you know, wants to have a chat about that, um, totally open to it. Just give me a buzz. I mean, reach out again on social media or the website and, you know, you get routed onto me and, yeah. Good on you, it's, mate. Uh, it's, it's, it's community driven. Uh, it's people being active. It's, it's small, small solutions, small, you know, actions that all add up and, you know, human behavior is the greatest challenge that we have. It's not plastic. It's not recycling because, you know, you, you think about it like imagine you had the perfect material and you had the perfect recovery system. You'd still, beha human behavior, you know, if, you, if you're lazy, you're going to break that chain. And so we need to, you know, everyone has a role and everyone has a responsibility and, you know, consumers and producers and industry, like, you know, they've, they've got a lot to account for. but you know, as humans as well, we, we also have a role. And so that's kind of how we see fixing the problem of the ocean is, you know, small actions by a lot of people and that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. 
All right, we could probably keep yarning on this stuff for uh, a long time, Pete, but we'll let people get on with their day or their evening. And uh, I'll just say again, keep up the great work and thank you for all that you've achieved over the last five years and beyond. Uh, and any, any final words for you or where you want to send people to follow the journey? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, if you just check out Stevian Project on any social media channel, it except for TikTok. Um, yeah, you can contact us there and just follow the journey. And, you know, it's, we, we try and be as transparent as we can and tell an authentic story. And um, just, yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone listening and, you know, refuse single use and reuse a, have a reusable water bottle and a cake cup for your coffees and teas and we'll be fine. You know, the world's going to be okay. It's just going to take a while to fix it. And humans are the ones that are at risk. All right, mate, we'll, uh, we'll leave it for there. Thanks for your time. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, bye.